Picture a massive, clear lake. The water is calm, the weather is warm, and the sun is just slightly peeking above the tall, green, jagged mountains encircling the horizon to the east where your gaze is cast. On your right side, in the distance, a long, narrow railroad bridge stretches across the water to a track extending southward along the lake's far shore. Behind you, an expanse of bright green grass hosts a shady park with the sandy beach you're standing on. In front of you, a concrete breakwater, about the width of a sidewalk, runs out about fifty feet over the clear water. Walk forward along the narrow causeway. The water is so clean that you can see the sandy bottom receding from view and growing darker as you get further from shore. At the end of this narrow cement pier is a ten-foot-tall replica of the Statue of Liberty. She faces you. Someone has painted her left toenails a lively, pinkish, purple, paisley pattern that a teenager might sport during flip-flop season. The dull green on her other toes has weathered away to reveal the gray metal body beneath Liberty's painted veneer. It is an August morning as pretty as you can imagine, in a place as fine as you would care to seek, and everything is right with the world. Let's begin. If you happen to be a neurotypical person, then you probably have a very nice mental image of the place I just described. You may even want to visit. If you're a skilled enough Googler, you may even be able to find that place I just described. That would be a heck of a telepathic feat. What is this, cognitively speaking? A minor miracle, I'd say. Not only that you can conjure a decent representative image of a place you've likely never been, but that all those cues came from a bunch of squiggly lines written on a page. It boggles the mind when you compare this feature of human thought with the millions of other animal species that don't even come close to anything resembling this ability. Where does this cognitive talent come from? Let's ignore the written component for a moment and get to the root of the cognitive trick here. We're going to go back to oral storytellers, and even beyond that as best we can, to the cognitive basis for narrative thought. This is going to involve another leap of imagination, some help from some friends and animals, and a bit of an open mind. Now, picture, if you will, a mammal-like creature, maybe a small one. Let's call it an ancestor. Its vision is probably very basic compared to ours, but it has a keen nose and can move very quickly. It's a predator and a scavenger. Today, it's on the hunt. Cognitively, it has the ability to remember places, to orient itself in the world, and likely to form a mental image of a new place in order to remember it. Its prey is a small leaf eater that really likes ferns. Our creature is following a trail it picked up when it first noticed a footprint in the mud. It then picked up its prey's scent. Since then, it has been following signs. More footprints, a strong odor, half-eaten fern fronds with little teeth marks in them. Memory tells our little hunter that a meal awaits it at the end of this trail with a little lock. What's in this creature's head as it examines these signs? It clearly has the ability to connect the footprint's odor and teeth marks in the leaves with its target. Can it see its prey in its mind's eye? Do these environmental signs cue the vision of a living animal munching away on ferns unsuspectingly? The ability to form mental imagery and map space is curiously found in the same brain area, the hippocampus. This area is also fundamental to multiple memory processes. Damage to this area of the brain results in an inability to process scenes and form new memories, as well as an ability to understand narratives. This is a curious and critical trifecta with our purposes in mind. So is our little hunter working through the rudimentary elements of a story? A quest narrative of sorts, with the goal of a full belly? I'd say yes. I'd also speculate that rudimentary imagery helps to facilitate its memory of its target and of its orientation in its environment. These are speculations, but they're well informed by modern neurological understanding of how the rodent brain works and a little by how the human brain works. If you ask me where narrative began, I'd say here, long before any discernible spoken language was ever uttered. And if you asked me what the first stories were, I'd speculate that they were likely recountings of battles and hunts around proto-human campfires, told in grunts, pantomime, and single-word signifiers that recalled a shared experience of the hunters. I suspect that even the structure of sentences themselves are undergirded by the structure of narrative itself, with a cue, a constraint, and a resolution, such as, 
found sign of prey, followed trail, caught dinner, much like subject, verb, object. And from these first rudimentary stories, which proved useful enough to give our ancestors a competitive advantage, more words and more complex stories were formed. And one useful advantage this talent gave our ancestors was the ability to convey to fellow tribe members the features of their environment and the potential threats and dangers lurking therein. Croc in water. Lions near. Enemy coming. Near Eagle Rock. Slowly, signifiers like these got used for many other purposes. The connection between memory, imagery, and stories is compelling. Scene construction. The ability to form mental images is both a critical component of comprehending stories and a time-tested technique for improving memory. Speakers in preliterate societies, including some very notable Greek and Roman orators, used both image-based mnemonic techniques and mental maps to remember and recall vast amounts of information, techniques that modern memory champions still use today. One of the most useful and reliable of these techniques is the root method, a tactic where a person places visual images of new information on a mental map they're already intimately familiar with, which allows the person to mentally walk back through the route and recall the new information placed there. For example, if you've lived in your current house or apartment for longer than a month, you've internalized a mental map of this environment. Close your eyes and walk through the front door. What's in that first space as you walk inside? Coat hangers, a shoe rack, a table where you keep your keys in a little basket, maybe a closet? I don't know what your place looks like, but I can picture mine from the front door all the way to the attic. By developing mnemonic images that accompany new information, I can mentally place each new image at a point on the mental map of my house and recall it simply by imagining a walk through this well-known territory. So what does this have to do with stories? Maybe nothing directly. Maybe a lot. Some of what we know about the bardic storytellers, the Homers, Hesiods, and Chaucers, comes from Milman Parry, a scholar of Homeric poetry, who revealed the use of formulaic phrases in Homer that indicate the epics were composed as oral stories that were roughly memorized and then performed slightly differently each time until they were finally written down, perhaps hundreds of years later, after they were first sung. These techniques, which include things like formulaic type scenes and recurring descriptions of characters, are still in use among Slavic bards, who tell the same long stories slightly differently each time. A modern reader, looking at the Iliad or the Odyssey, might consider it a nearly supernatural task to recite the entire epic, as the ancient Greek storytellers supposedly did over several days. It would require a seemingly impossible feat of memory to perform such a monumental task, at first glance. But, armed with certain tools at their disposal, mnemonic visualization, formulaic descriptions, type scenes, and epithets, a bard could realistically build a massive memory route that contained the entirety of Homer's epics. I personally became intrigued by the idea of improving my retention of knowledge right as I was considering graduate school. To test the techniques I learned from world memory champion Christine Stenger's book, A Sheep Falls Out of a Tree, I decided to memorize a list of vocabulary words I gathered from various GRE prep books. In a span of about six weeks, with a lot of effort and discipline, I was able to memorize a list of 2,500 words, and on the day I sat for the exam, if you had about eight hours to listen, I could have run through the entire list in order without missing a single word. I also don't think it's an accident that the Homeric epics and these mnemonic techniques both come down to us from the same culture. Scholars have speculated about the training of ancient bards as a long apprenticeship, and along with the belief that these bards traveled the countryside performing their epic tales, it would follow that these bards would have had massive mental maps of various different landscapes from which to draw. I could easily picture a master poet retracing territory on the way from one town to another, schooling his successor on the events and descriptions that unfold at each place on a large mental map containing snippets of the foundational tales in their tradition. Given what I was able to memorize in six weeks, I could easily see a lifetime's application of building a vast mental landscape of the Homeric epics, resulting in a skilled poet being able to perform the works from memory on command. 
but is a text a map, and what does that have to do with space in the story world? And more importantly, how can any of this make you a better writer? The answer to question one, is a text a map, is no, a text is not a map. But as we discussed before, visual imagery and mental mapping take place in the same brain area. They're closely related, and they're vital to a reader's ability to process a story. The narratologist Mary Laura Ryan explored the relationship between stories and mapping of a story world space in perhaps the most interesting exploration of story and space I've ever read. She had a group of high school students read Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novel, Chronicle of a Death Foretold, and then had them draw a map of the fictional town where the story unfolded. Their maps varied tremendously, much in the same way the maps would vary if you asked these same students to draw a map of their hometown. But the maps all had similar features, and all the students seemed to be able to place certain landmarks, like the protagonist's house, the river, and the church, into a spatial relationship with one another. Ryan points out that this spatial relationship is necessary. Otherwise, how would a reader be able to imagine the character movements necessary for a dynamic story world? One of the most interesting results in her experiment was that the maps were filled with mistakes and contradictions, indicating that the reader, though they must be putting that space in the story world into some sort of spatial relationship for the purposes of scene construction, they largely aren't trying to recreate an accurate map of the story world space. Ryan noted that, quote, The novel offered more spatial information than my memory could hold and the mapping activity would not have been possible without a piece of paper. So it seems that a reader would likely only be using the spatial information at hand to visualize the present scene. This will likely result in representations that are inaccurate or contradictory without the reader ever being aware of these inaccuracies. Ryan also contrasted the differing perspectives of the maps. On the one hand, a flat view from above, with, on the other hand, pictorial elements some of her students placed in their representations. A modern-day metaphor would be the difference between map view and street view on Google Maps, with the former representing the landscape viewed from above and the latter dropping the viewer into the observer's perspective. The reader's perspective, though it may implicitly involve generating a story space map, isn't a literal mapping of space. Rather, it seems to be the creation of an episodic sequence of images envisioned from a certain viewpoint. The totality of a story, experienced in this way, functions more like a temporal mosaic of imagined scenes that the reader implicitly cobbles together into a story world. How fun! And very lucky for us writers. Here's why. You don't have to be a cartographer to be a writer. You don't have to hire an architect to lay out your character's floor plan. Nor do you need to have a collection of maps on your desk, like you'd find in the front pages of various adventure stories, like Lord of the Rings, Treasure Island, A Song of Ice and Fire, or the map of the Star Wars galaxy, where you can figure out how many light years it is from Endor to Hoth. These artifacts may help some geographically inclined readers to enjoy big stories, but they clearly aren't critical. Experiencing a story spatially is a bit like being dropped into a new town unexpectedly. Different people are going to map that new space in different ways, some more clearly and more successfully than others. But, unless they have some kind of neurological impairment, they're going to map that space, implicitly and involuntarily. And unless authorial errors are ridiculous and glaring, the reader will likely never notice that the geography of the story world hasn't been surveyed with a compass, a level, and a plumb. The telepathic game is a cooperative game and the construction of space is one element where the reader does the bulk of the work for you. Readers bring a lot of creative force to the table in this regard. The great news for the modern writer is that the cognitive revolution of the last 40 years has taught us a lot about how people process spatial relations and form mental imagery and map space. Narrative theorists have taken notice, and they've used a lot of this new information to study how texts organize spatial cues for readers. We're going to examine how the spatial cues in stories can be either vivid and immersive, or vague and disorienting. Both can be effective in generating a desired experience for your reader. We'll look at how your readers build expectations for common scenarios based on place, and we'll explore how to effectively invite your reader onto the scene of your story world, 
and how to push them out of it if you choose to do so. We'll briefly look at the role objects play in stories, and we'll explore the common elements of memorable images that seem to last in a reader's memory long after they've finished reading. All this, I think, stems from an evolved memory that long precedes language. This is the cognitive trick that makes stories possible. It can take you to a prehistoric village, a futuristic space station, or to the center of New York City, all in the span of a few words. Or it can bring you back to that clear lake with me on that cement causeway with Lady Liberty staring back at you on a sunny morning I remember well, when a bald eagle glided silently over the water and a freight train clicked its way south over the long bridge into the green mountains on the other side. When your readers sit down to read your story, they have an object in their hands. With the exception of the printed medium, hardcover, paperback, ebook, etc., the text of the story is exactly the same. As I've mentioned more than a few times, a text is an object, and books are mass produced to be identical objects. But the story will never be the same for two different readers. This lesson is about how it gets different. This lesson is about the things the reader does for you, how they take your words and process them into their cognitive simulation. This is about how they make the story come alive. Part of our drawn-out story definition goes like this. Language-based instructions arranged in an order that cues the reader to simulate an approximate cognitive model of a specific modal universe. Reading fiction, when you boil it down to its essence, is the effort the reader's mind makes to process those words into a cognitive simulation approximating the experience intended by the author when they offered the words, sentences, and events the specific way they did. We don't need to think too much about the words on the page just yet. That's the next episode. For now, we're going to focus on the images those words produce, the sequence of scenes that add up to the reader experiencing your story world. The reader's part in our little telepathic dance is a big one, obviously, but it's a very difficult issue to grapple with for writers, narrative theorists, and cognitive scientists alike. This is because while the writer creates something concrete and measurable, a reproducible text, the reader provides inferences and memories, and those are two very fuzzy things. Let's look at a passage that explores what I mean. A blacked cape figure prowled among the houses. An owl screeched. Three children were borne away into the night. Take a moment to think about those three sentences. I'm going to read them again. A blacked cape figure prowled among the houses. An owl screeched. Three children were borne away into the night. Now think about what your mind does with these three sentences. Narrative theorist David Herman offers this micro-narrative as a case study in the reader's cooperative effort. He points out that a reader generally draws inferences about the causality of events. In this case, did you connect the caped figure to the three children being carried away into the night? Did you notice that nothing in the text explicitly indicates that the black caped figure had anything to do with the children's disappearance? If this were a trial, Capey would get off. All the evidence is circumstantial. Just because an owl screeched and the kids were born away doesn't prove our caped friend had anything to do with it. Maybe it was Batman out looking for kidnappers and the owl was like, what's up, Batman? What are you doing in these parts? Yet, the reader's mind is going to infer causality and connect these events as you probably did. Inferences like these are a huge part of what the reader brings to the table. What about the houses? Did you visualize some of those? What type of houses were they? And the owl? What about Owly? Was he perched on a tree branch in your simulation as Batman was running by? If you think, yes, Ro, there was a tree, that's interesting because there's no mention of trees whatsoever in the text. But I'm guessing there's at least a hint of one in your simulation. Readers construct cognitive imagery around the skeletal structure of the written. 
We visualize things that aren't in the text explicitly. How do we do this? Technically, I mean cognitively. Picture a hospital room. Take a few moments. Think about it. Pause and visualize a hospital room. Form a mental image. What does this room look like? What's in it? It probably looks a lot like a hospital room. A bed or two, those sliding curtains, a window on the wall opposite the doorway. And there should be a sink where the caregivers can wash their hands. Also, there's a TV hanging at the foot of each bed. A couple chairs and a pair of rolling tray tables, as well as a bunch of doohickeys and cables connected to the wall and IV poles that are dangling near the head of the beds. Wow, that's a lot, right? All that's in the memory bucket for hospital room, stored away in Rose's brain. And there's probably a lot more, too, if I were willing to try your patience any further with this example. This type of memory is called schematic memory, and the items I just described are schema or schemata, depending on whether you're dealing with the singular or plural. Cognitive scientists usually define schema as something like knowledge describing what is typical or frequent in a particular situation. Like with memory of many complex events, your brain relies on schematic information to fill gaps in memory about space and place. Our brains, by necessity, are very good at compressing repeated information. It's why you don't stress about the color of the walls in your house unless you're painting them. They just fall into the background and you give them no thought. You don't need to think about what color they are all the time. Similarly, if you walked into a hospital room, you wouldn't give the normal features of the room much thought at all. You've got more important things on your mind, like whether the patient you've come to visit is going to be all right. You don't have to spend any time figuring out things that are crucial to your understanding of the situation. These can be as basic as, what is the purpose of a hospital, and why is my family member there? Once you've acquired a sufficient base of schematic knowledge about hospitals, you never have to ask those questions again. If you brought a child with you into that hospital room, though, a child who's never been to a hospital, then you're likely to get a whole lot of questions. What are those things on the wall? Why are those tubes attached to grandma? What do those buttons on the bed do? This is a person mapping space, building schematic memory that they can recall later. It pays for people to understand their environment, and picking out the similarities and, more importantly, the prominent differences between environments is crucial to a person's ability to understand their environment and social contexts as well. Thus, as writers, we need to assume a baseline amount of schematic knowledge about the situations we're writing about, because our readers are going to fill in a lot of major gaps that don't need to be explicitly presented in the text. For instance, if your character goes to visit someone in the hospital, you probably don't need to do too much to call up an accurate representative image of the room. They'll also understand implicitly that the other character is very sick that they're probably lying in bed wearing a gown and are attached to an IV drip by a clear plastic tube. So let's check out a writer using generalized schematic information to help construct a setting. This is an excerpt from the short story Bible by Tobias Wolff. And at this point in the story, the female protagonist, a teacher, is being forced into her car by an unknown assailant in an empty parking lot. The keys, give them to me. Maureen held the keys out behind her. Eyes pressed shut. She had just one thought. Do not see him. The keys were taken from her hand. She heard the door being unlocked. Open it, the man said. Open the door. Yes, now, get in. Just take it, Maureen said. Please. Please, will you get in? Please. He took her arm and half pushed, half lifted her into the car and slammed the door shut. She sat behind the steering wheel with her head bent, eyes closed, hands folded over her purse. The passenger door opened. Compositions, the man muttered. Exams, she said, and cringed at her stupidity in correcting him. Maureen heard the blue books thud onto the floor in the back. Then he was on the seat beside her. He sat there a moment, breathing quick, shallow breaths. Open your eyes. Open. Yes, now drive. He jingled the keys, looking straight ahead over the wheel. She said, I don't think I can. There isn't a lot of specific information about this teacher's car. A bit earlier in the story, there's a mention of a new paint job fading, but it's hard to make the case that the car is described in detail. There are a few places where the setting elements are referenced explicitly, and essentially the narrator mentions two doors, the keys, the steering wheel, the two seats, and the floor in the back. 
Presumably, though, there's a dashboard, a radio, a glove compartment, a rearview mirror, all the vital stuff. And depending on the reader, some of that is going to appear in their simulation of the scene. But Wolf's narrator leaves it to the imagination. There are a couple good reasons for this. First, this is a place all readers are going to have a strong schematic memory for. People spend a lot of time in cars. We all know what's in that space. Eco-critics, literary scholars who study portrayals of the environment in literature, they call settings like these non-spaces. Generally, the term non-space is reserved for very generic human-created spaces that seem the same everywhere, like the inside of a McDonald's or Starbucks, or a bus station or an airport terminal. And the interior of a car, given that cars are mass-produced, works here as well. The next good reason to leave a lot to the reader's imagination is the plot. What does it matter whether the teacher is driving a Subaru or a Ford? She's getting kidnapped. This is a highly suspenseful situation, and the narrator rightly keeps the focus on the abductor and his victim. That's where the primary drama in the story comes from. Great authors like Tobias Wolff know when the scenery matters and when it doesn't. And when the protagonist is getting forced into her car by a stranger, the reader can decide whether her car is a teal sedan or a purple minivan doesn't really matter to the story. Lastly, you already know what kind of car she drives, don't you? She's a teacher with exam books in her front seat. It's not a Lamborghini or a Tesla. It's probably not even a mid-tier sedan. She's driving some sort of compact economy car or a crappy 10-year-old sedan or minivan. So why mention the doors, the steering wheel, and the seats at all then, if the reader can fill in the blanks? Easy. All the references to the car orient the characters in the space, outlining the drama. For instance, him pushing her into the car lets the reader know he's in control of the situation and places her in a specific space the reader can visualize from, the driver's seat. This is bare-bones description of setting, only enough to complement the plot and give the reader enough of a frame to make the scene come to life with their input you'll see a lot of very successful writing take advantage of vague, generic settings like a car, a living room, or an office. That's where people live, after all. More specialized schematic knowledge can be a bit trickier for the writer. Here's an example of what I mean from Maggie Shipstead's The Cowboy Tango. At this part in the story, the ranch owner is giving young Sammy a test to see if she can handle herself around horses. He dropped a saddle and a bridle in her arms and showed her a short-legged twist of a buckskin, a bitch mare who had nearly thrown Mr. Audubosh. When Sammy pulled the cinch tight, the mare flattened her ears and lunged around, her square teeth biting the air until they met Sammy's hard-swung fist. The mare squealed and pointed her nose at the sky, but then she stood still. Sammy climbed up. The mare dropped her head and crow-hopped off to the right. Sammy jerked the reins up, but not meanly, and kicked the mare through the gate into the home paddock. In five minutes, she had her going around like a show pony. There are some places in this passage where the schematic knowledge is a bit more specialized than generic car. Things like a saddle and a bridle, short-legged twist of a buckskin, pulled the cinch tight, crow hopped off to the right, home paddock. In this case, the setting is a horse ranch, and the schematic knowledge the reader will be calling up from memory is their horse ranch bucket of memories. Imagine you're a reader from Queens or Inglewood. Perhaps you've never seen a horse ranch, much less ridden a horse. Your horse ranch memory bucket is going to be a lot less full than a reader from Montana. You might not know exactly what a cinch, a bridle, or a home paddock is, but Shipstead's narrator doesn't pause here to explain. Even if all you know about riding horses is that you need a saddle, that's enough schematic knowledge to build around. Your readers, just like you, are going to be pretty good at picking up meaning from the context. What's a crow hop? I suppose it's just good enough to visualize a horse jumping like a crow. And that's not the way a well-trained horse moves. Seems like Sammy's got her work cut out for her. A home paddock? Well, she's riding the horse there, and there's a gate, so it's probably something like a pen near the barn, right? Good enough. And that's one of the keys to understanding how to manage schematic knowledge in your stories. The human mind is a product of cognitive trade-offs, and the most common trade-off is a version of the old maxim, done is better than perfect. The mind is prone to making many small mistakes in processing, but it usually gets things mostly right, most of the time, which allows us to keep on living. 
As writers, a few cues that help the reader access schematic knowledge and understand context will set the reader off in the right direction, allowing them to follow and fill in the blanks as they go along. The other useful attribute of specialized schematic knowledge is that it lends a sense of authenticity to the story. A reader learning what a home paddock is for the first time is a reader experiencing a cowboy story, going new places and seeing new things. And again, note how the action takes precedence over the setting. This is a great example of specialized schematic knowledge done well, neither over or underexplained, just presented as a complement to the plot. What about when the schemata become part of the plot? Okay, that may not make much sense worded as such, but that's what's up next on our to-do list. You have a ton of schematic knowledge for places, but you also have schematic knowledge for events. Narrative theorists call these scripts, and you have a ton of them in your head. You sit down at a restaurant and what happens? Someone hands you and your fellow diners a menu, fills your water glasses, and says, Hi, welcome to Red Lobster. My name is Terry, and I'll be taking care of you today. Right? It's almost exactly like that every time. You can bank on these everyday occurrences going a certain way. So much so that when a waiter, a teller at a bank, a bus driver, or a flight attendant deviates from their script, it's immediately notable or noteworthy. Scripts were first described for narrative theorists by the computer programmer Roger Shank, who defined them this way. A script is a structure that describes an appropriate sequence of events in a particular context. A script is made up of slots and requirements about what can fill these slots. Shank was experimenting with AI that could generate stories, and one of the byproducts of trying to figure out how to program an AI to tell stories was discovering the vast number of inferences a reader makes in order to understand the context of a story. Scripts were a big part of this. A computer wouldn't immediately understand why a waiter kept returning to the table to fill the water glasses, or even that humans drink water. The AI needs to be told everything, but people rely on schema and scripts to compare what's happening now with what they expect to happen based on past experiences and context. So when your character gets on the bus, she's going to stop at the front, pay her fare, maybe say hello to the bus driver if she's friendly, and then take her seat. Your readers are going to understand that process based on their script for getting on bus. Scripts have two great advantages that writers can exploit. The first is that a script can allow your story to be compressed the same way a certain amount of schematic knowledge can be left to the reader. If your character is renting a car, unless something relevant to the plot or characterization is happening, the writer doesn't need to present the script in its entirety, or perhaps even at all. This can help to streamline the story and keep it only to the interesting bits. The other advantage of a script is that when your characters deviate from the script, it's going to catch your reader's attention just as it would in real life. Here's an example of perhaps the most shocking and riveting deviation from a script I've ever read from Cormac McCarthy's No Country for Old Men. This is the start of the infamous gas station scene where serial killer Anton Chigurh goes inside to pay for his gas, a transaction we all know well. Then this happens. Y'all getting any rain up your way? The proprietor said. Which way would that be? I seen you was from Dallas. Chigurh picked his change up off the counter. And what business of yours is it where I'm from, friendo? I didn't mean nothing by it. You didn't mean nothing by it. I was just passing the time of day. I guess that passes for manners in your cracker view of things. Well, sir, I apologize, and if you don't want to accept my apology, I don't know what else I can do for you. A normal person's script, of course, requires that Chigurh says something like, Nope, been a dry summer up my way. But he's not playing, because Chigurh is not a normal person, and that's what sets this scene off on a terrifying tangent. It outlines the hair-trigger personality that could get a person killed in an instant whenever they have the misfortune to come in contact with Chigurh. But it also outlines the role Chance plays in the killer's worldview. The way he deviates from expectations catches the reader's interest, and knowing that he's a psychopath helps to keep the reader in even greater suspense. As the scene unfolds, the cashier becomes increasingly aware of what the reader already knows, that Chigurh might very well end his life over a harmless attempt at small talk with the wrong guy. Scripts are useful to compress needless procedures and processes, 
but they're great when your character breaks from script to a purpose. Script should not be confused with a similar idea in storytelling called scenes affaire, which in French means something approximating scenes that must be done. These are scenes that are so common to a genre that they're almost obligatory. Think the diagnosis scene in a medical drama or a gunfight in a western. Scenes affair differ from scripts in that there are many different ways that they could go down, whereas a script has a much more prescribed set of actions that are expected to be followed. With a scene affair, it would be hard to imagine a global plot of its kind without that type of scene like an I love you scene in a romance, an interrogation in a murder mystery, or a final fight against the villain in a superhero film. Scripts refer much more to a specific element of a local plot, like getting on a bus, checking out a library book, or boarding a plane. And a final and critical concept to understanding how your readers will constitute the textual simulation from the words on the page is brought to us by who else? Mary Laura Ryan. She calls this the principle of minimal departure, and it works like this. The colonists on Omega Prime were an extraordinarily happy lot, living a nearly utopian existence hidden away in the Vernian Nebula, far from the reach of the Imperial Federation. Their dome-like glass cities resembled massive crystal cathedrals rising toward the night sky, like glittering monuments to creative ingenuity. They were a civilization of artists and scientists who spent most of their days in the peaceful pursuit of knowledge and artisanship. They loved music and games and had brought their ingenious technology for industrial food production, so as not to threaten this foreign planet's magnificent biodiversity with any invasive species. If it weren't for their hideous bug-like appearance and rancid natural odor, Jake and Judy would have thought they'd crash-landed in some civilization of angels. But the colonists of Omega Prime were not angels. They called themselves Glorkunks, and they were the ugliest aliens Jake and Judy had ever seen. Show of hands, who thought the Glorkunks were people? It's okay, feel free to put the hand up. The thing is, the principle of minimal departure ordains that you probably thought Glorkunks were people. Why? Because the text gave you no indication they weren't, until it did. How could a reader be expected to imagine smelly, bug-like creatures randomly? Minimal departure is a bit like a generic construct that your mind inserts into the text and then hangs onto until the narrator indicates the specific details of the construct that should be altered to fit the story. So, until Ishmael forms the reader that one of Captain Ahab's legs has been eaten by a whale and that he hobbles around on a peg leg, the reader will assume that Ahab has two legs, because the general cognitive blueprint for a person has two legs. This works for spaces as well. If a story is set in a city, your reader is going to load their generic schematic memories for city, unless and until your narrator informs them how they must deviate from this schematic knowledge to create the correct specific images to distinguish your story world from the real world. The city in your story is going to look an awful lot like the reader's idea of a city. Until you tell them that it's a dome-like glass city resembling a massive crystal cathedral like on Omega Prime. So if your story is set on Earth in the present day, you won't have to do a lot of work to get your reader on the same page as far as story world schemata and scripts. If you're writing a sci-fi set in a distant galaxy or a dragon adventure in a fantasy world, the details must extend out from a general conceptualization of human life in that place and era. It's important to remember that your text, the words on the page, doesn't start from scratch at word one. The building of a story world is a cooperative effort between your words and the reader's memory to direct them in creating characters and places that pull them away from their general understanding of the real world. Their role in the drama isn't to be underestimated, but it is to be understood. Schema, scripts, and minimal departure will bring you much closer to a greater understanding, I hope. As writers, we don't need to start from scratch. Rather, creating a compelling story world is about selecting the right details that guide the reader in drawing on the correct schema and scripts, and also deviating from those schema and scripts in interesting ways to prompt the creation of a unique story world in your reader's mind. In the coming lessons, we'll look specifically at how readers construct mental spaces and images in order to help you to guide their construction of your story world.
The dynamic story world must have movement in it. This means that your readers must envision characters and objects in a spatial relationship with one another, even if these relationships are not explicitly spelled out in the text. In other words, even if your reader isn't mapping the story in the way Mary Laura Ryan asked her students to do a couple lessons back, the reader is still implicitly mapping space by placing the characters in an imagined space. This lesson is about how our brains map space. Understanding this process will help us to learn how to create vivid story world spaces for our stories to unfold in. Regions. To keep things in a logical order, I'm going to start from the outside in. Think of a big map. This is how we'll begin. On the largest scale, apart from the entire story world itself, we have regions, which can either be real or fictitious, and can vary in size greatly. A region, just as in the real world, will vary depending on the frame the narrator chooses to impose, or the one the reader adopts spontaneously, if it's not specified by the text. Regions can also have various subregions. You might think of this relationship as something like region, the Midwest, subregion, Michigan, sub subregion, the Upper Peninsula, and so forth. Depending on the story you're trying to tell, these distinctions may or may not be very important. So don't fret if your story doesn't clearly define all these spatial references. Regions often carry schematic associations of varying specificity. These associations, depending on how specific, can carry immersive power with them, as Mary Laura Ryan explored in her study of literary immersiveness. Generic stereotypical descriptions of the regions, like desert town, tropical resort, wealthy suburb, or the like, will help your reader to call up an image of the region to serve as the story's setting. Even though these terms are nonspecific, your reader's schematic memories for stereotypical places will populate their mental simulation with specific imagery, called to mind from their memories. Call up a farmhouse, ghost town, or desert island, and you've just loaded a wealth of schematic setting information for your reader to visualize, which can make a story surprisingly spatially immersive with surprisingly few spatial details from the text. Even more schematically loaded are place names with specific and well-known schematic imagery. For almost everyone, city names like London, Paris, New York, and Tokyo will call up specific imagery like Big Ben or the Eiffel Tower, as well as less specific imagery like black cabs, yellow taxis, packed subway cars, and black-suited salarymen crossing crosswalks and droves. City sounds, smells, and other sights are likely to come along for the ride. The most schematically loaded places, of course, will be settings that readers have actually visited themselves, especially places they're intimately familiar with. One story I found particularly resonant for me because of this type of place association was Melanie Ray Thawne's short story Xmas, Jamaica Plain, which is set in a Boston neighborhood I knew well when I read the story. I found it especially easy to picture the apartment that was the setting for the story because I'd been inside many apartments in JP over the years. As a result, I found that story extremely spatially immersive. Even if places are fictional, Naming specific elements of the place, whether they be regions, landmarks, streets, etc., will give the reader a specific cognitive point around which to anchor their mental simulation. This will help in the reader building a more clearly delineated and therefore more immersive story world map. Borders. At the edge of regions, there are often borders. These make great cognitive reference points for readers, especially in an adventure or quest narrative. An excellent example of a regional boundary comes from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy. Perhaps the most clearly defined region is Mordor, which is so clearly delineated because of its borders, both natural and unnatural, as it's surrounded by a nearly impassable mountain range, and its entrance along the road is a massive, heavily guarded gate. Mordor is a much more clearly defined region than the other regions in the epic, as a character is either in or out of Mordor, based on their relationship to these clear borders, which the other regions of the tale lack. Constructed boundaries can be fences, walls, doors, etc., and natural boundaries can be mountains, rivers, canyons, oceans, etc. Smaller spaces, such as buildings and rooms, are also bounded by borders, like walls and doors, which delineate in and out. Landmarks. 
Within regions, the best contextual spatial markers are landmarks. Landmarks are any fixed point on the story world's map that a reader can cognitively pinpoint. It could be a character's house, a building, a statue, or an actual landmark like the Statue of Liberty or a Washington Monument. If a character could point to it on a map of their story world, it's a landmark, and landmarks are extremely useful in helping the reader to orient the story's characters in space. Pathways. Also useful for orienting characters on the story world map are pathways. A pathway is created in the story world whenever two landmarks are referenced. If there isn't any contextual information to help the reader understand the relative orientation of these two points, then the pathway is only theoretical. But pathways become much more concrete if the characters move between the two landmarks, even implicitly. Here's an example of characters implicitly walking down a path between two landmarks from Lauren Groff's short story, Delicate Edible Birds. Here, a group of fleeing news reporters are abducted by a Nazi-sympathizing French farmer during World War II. Initially, they're eating dinner at the Frenchman's table in his farmhouse, which was described in detail before this happens. I'm very sorry, but I'll have to keep all of you fine foreigners here until the Germans come, won't I? Prisoners. And who knows what they'll do when they find you? You can't do that, said Victor. Oh, can't I? said Nicola. And it was not a question. Now, boys, he said to his sons, lock them in the barn. Then they moved, one by one, into the night, Lucci kissing the hand of the old woman in thanks for the meal. The barn was one of the buildings of stone, dark and chill, more a cellar than a barn. Inside was a great mass of hay and a mound of potatoes and one ugly old donkey that bit at Lucci when he tried to make friends. This pathway, I would say, is about 70% explicit, with both landmarks clearly delineated and movement between the two points directly cued. Though the reporter's entrance to the barn is left to the reader's imagination, it's still a strongly mapped literary space, even though there's no specific information presented that cues distance or direction of the pathway. Often, the existence of two clear landmarks and character movement from A to B is enough to stimulate a strong, specific sense of movement across the story world's landscape. I've found pathways to be an excellent way to invite spatial immersion in a story, especially early in the narrative. It's a subtle, psychological trick that figuratively invites the reader into the story world by physically moving the characters along a pathway that draws the reader into the story world space. Figures and Grounds At the smallest scale of story world environments, objects become figures and spaces become grounds. Okay, what does this mean? A figure is any object in the story world, fixed or movable, that can be located in a scene. It might be easiest to think of figures as objects in a room or in proximity of the characters in outdoor spaces. Things like tables and chairs, a tree or a lamppost, or the characters themselves. Figures need a space to exist on or in, and this space is called a ground. I haven't done any study of this, but my intuition is that many grounds and stories are simply implied. For example, if I mentioned a character moving from the kitchen table to the couch in the living room, my suspicion is that few authors would feel the need to mention the floor. It would just be implied. But it's certainly not out of the ordinary for a writer to mention a specific ground to help a reader form a clear image. Here's Humbert Humbert doing just that from a passage you may recall. Lo, Lola, Lolita! I hear myself crying from a doorway into the sun. In the middle of a trim turfed surface, I found her at last. She had run out before I was ready. Oh, Lolita! There she was, playing with a damned dog, not me. I put a gentle hand to my chest as I surveyed the situation. In this case, the ground is the trim turfed surface, and the figures are Lolita herself and the dog she's playing with. An added possibility for potential confusion is this. Depending on the frame, a figure can theoretically become a ground and vice versa. Take the following passage. Lindsay took the book off the coffee table and opened it to the page where she'd left off. Sitting between pages 149 and 150 was her bookmark, adorned with smiling blue-spotted ladybugs. She was almost halfway through her summer reading. Note in the first sentence how the initial ground is the coffee table and the figure is the book sitting on it. 
In the second sentence, the book itself has become the new ground where the bookmark, resting between two pages, has now become the figure. How figures and grounds shift isn't a particularly critical point, except to note that they do shift depending on the frame of reference. Grounds become figures, and figures become grounds. Here's where the discussion of figures and grounds can help to smooth out the imagery in your stories. Stories are linear in that one word precedes another, and therefore when a reader is constructing an image, the figure must precede the ground or vice versa. It can be valuable to pay close attention to this process because of a phenomenon I'm going to call regrounding. Regrounding, on the whole, I think, can hurt the flow of a story, and it happens a lot in mediocre fiction. Suppose I were writing a story, and in it a character was cooking eggs. Observe the following example. Gina was standing by the stove cooking eggs for breakfast when Thomas came into the kitchen. The steam from the boiling water was glowing a dull orange from the rising sun creeping through the kitchen window. Gina liked her eggs poached. By no means is this a terrible passage in terms of cueing a spatial simulation. There are some decent spatial details that help to direct a reader to construct a scene. But were you at all surprised by the second sentence? Even though it cues a nice visual image of the orange-hued steam rising above the stove, unless you're one of the few people out there like Gina, who likes your eggs poached, when I wrote cooking eggs in the first sentence, you probably pictured something different, like the figure of fried or scrambled eggs in the ground of a skillet. The eggs then must be regrounded from the skillet you probably envisioned at first to the pot that Gina was actually using. I certainly don't offer this as a hard and fast rule, but I think that unless you're trying to surprise your readers, you should strive to offer grounds before figures. Forming mental imagery is a difficult enough task to ask your readers to perform if your prose frequently forces them to erase and modify the images they've already struggled to construct, it may push them out of the story. It may not even be something they, or you, ever notice explicitly. They'll likely notice that they're not as immersed in your story as they are in some other writer's stories, and they probably won't know why. Try to find ways to offer your reader the ground and then the figure so that they don't have to modify the sequence of images. Here's what that last passage might look like following a ground figure sequence. Gina was standing by the stove when Thomas came into the kitchen. In a large steaming pot of boiling water, Gina was poaching eggs for breakfast. The steam from the boiling water was glowing a dull orange from the rising sun creeping through the kitchen window. Again, this is a very subtle difference that doesn't much alter the meaning of the passage. What it does do is make the sequence of imagery linear. The reader doesn't have to retrace their steps and reground. It's just a little smoother. I mentioned this phenomenon once before, way back at the beginning of these lessons. Remember Stephen King's rabbit? If you recall his initial telepathic message, look, here's a table covered with a red cloth. On it is a cage the size of a small fish aquarium. In it is a rabbit with a pink nose and pink-rimmed eyes. In its front paws is a carrot stub, upon which it is contentedly munching. On its back, clearly marked in blue ink, is the numeral 8. I'd have to ask Stephen to see if he's consciously aware of it, but if you look at each sentence it follows the pattern. Ground, figure, ground, figure, ground, figure. He offers a table, covered by a cloth. Then he places the cage on the table then puts a rabbit in the cage, then puts pink eyes and a pink nose on that rabbit. And note in the final sentence, Stephen calls attention to the rabbit's back as a ground, then directs you to place the figure, the blue eight, on the ground he's already offered. There's zero chance of regrounding here. It's a smooth linear progression of imagery from the largest ground, the table, to the smallest figure, the blue numeral eight. This is one of the reasons Professor King is an all-time world bestseller. I strongly suspect he's aware that he works this way, but whether it's conscious or not, it's one of the reasons his prose is so smooth. Remember, ground, figure. In a hole in the ground, there lived the hobbit. From vast regions, all the way down to the smallest figures and objects, the story world space is a crucial element to every story. Your dynamic story world can vary from vague and shadowy to explicitly delineated, depending on how explicit and clearly ordered your text's cues are. But here, we've only covered the range of story world space. 
Next, we'll look at how your readers develop a sense of place and construct a complete story world. Studying space in the story world and how your reader processes this space is only part of the equation here. That a space exists is one thing. How the reader experiences this space represents a large portion of what makes a story a story. It isn't just spatial imagery that your reader will come away with if you've done your job well as a writer. They'll come away with an experience. This goes beyond just seeing and building space. This requires that a sense of place be developed in the reader's mind. How do great writers do this? That's what we're here to answer in this lesson, friends. And we're going to explore a few aspects of how writers turn an imaginary space into a simulated place. We'll talk atmosphere, mood, and immersiveness. The study of how a text evokes a reader's emotion is called affect theory in literary circles. And we'll just scratch the surface here, deep enough for our purposes. The difficulty with studying affect is that it is largely, and perhaps even mostly, subjective. Because of the individual reader's body of personal experience, the same cues might stimulate different associative memories. The smell of leaves on an autumn day might cue peaceful childhood memories for one reader, and for another reader, it could remind them of the day their mother died. Context in the story world can color these perceptions as well. In other words, affect gets messy. Add to this the fact that terminology related to the reader's experience is often metaphorical, atmosphere and mood being examples, and things get even more difficult to qualify. This is not to say that human beings are completely subjective in their feelings about specific cues. There are far more similarities that constrain the human experience than postmodern literary scholars would dare wrestle with. Show me a reader who experiences a positive affective association with a depiction of a character with a half-inch splinter driven under his fingernail, and I'll show you a neurology patient. Likewise, a cold glass of water on a hot, dry summer day is likely to evoke a sense of relief. Subjective does not mean random but it certainly means we're in messy territory outside the concrete, so away we go then. Atmosphere and mood are the terms in common usage that deal with how your reader experiences story worlds. They're used almost interchangeably, so much so that it took me considerable time and effort to even develop the subtle distinction that I'm going to present here. Both concern the effective experience a reader perceives when simulating story world space. Atmosphere. We're going to start with a passage that we'll examine as an example of a text cueing atmosphere. With atmosphere, we're dealing with what I can best describe as the sense of place a reader experiences when processing a text. Many theorists use the metaphor that readers will inhale an atmosphere while reading. I like to think of it as an experience, like experiencing New Orleans on Mardi Gras or the Sahara on the back of a camel. The sum feel of the setting. This is the opening paragraph of Lauren Groff's short story, Delicate Edible Birds. Because it had rained, and the rain had caught the black soot of the factories as they burned, Paris, in the dark, seemed covered by a dusky skin, almost as though it were living. The arches and the facades were the curve of a throat, the street corners, elbows, and in the silence, Byrne could almost hear the warm thumpings of some heart, deep beneath the residue of civilizations. Perhaps it was always there, but only audible now, in the dinless, abandoned city. As the last evacuees spun through the streets on their bicycles, they cast the puddles up into great wings of dark water behind them. Paris seemed so gentle as it awaited the Germans. The opening to this story, to me, is very much evocative of a time and place in history, and the details Groff's narrator provides assists me in building a sense of this place. There are some truly elegant details that help to create that sense of place. The soot from the burning factories, the rain, the dark puddles, 
and the quiet of a normally bustling city all combine to create the sense of calm dread I can imagine the denizens of Paris experiencing as the Nazis bore down on their beloved city. The corporeal language echoes a sense of vulnerability, the curve of a throat, and the warm thumping heartbeat beneath the residue of civilizations. God, what an opening! It helps that I've been to Paris, but the city of Paris, as we discussed in the last lesson, is loaded with schematic material for those who haven't actually been there. Who hasn't seen a romantic comedy where the couple ends up walking hand in hand down the Champs Elysees, or at a cafe while the spring sun illuminates a table adorned with wine and a fresh baguette, while a gentle accordion accompanies the murmur of breathy conversations in French? Who hasn't seen pictures of the Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, and the Arc de Triomphe? Groff's Paris draws on all that material and adorns it in soot, darkens the clear sky gray with rain, and makes it eerily silent. I feel this place. This is atmosphere, the feel of a setting, the entire city. And the ominous metaphorical atmosphere is perfectly attuned to the physical approach of the darkly wretched, soulless Third Reich. Paris weeps and shudders. Beautiful. Mood. The subtle difference between mood and atmosphere, to my mind, seems to be the scale of subjective feeling. Where atmosphere seems to be about a global sense of place, mood seems more about the subjective experience of being there, the feel of a place. There's a famous philosophy essay by Charles Nagel exploring the question of what it would feel like to be a bat, and some affect theorists have picked up on the pith of this essay, adopting the concept of what it is likeness, and if that doesn't make one shudder and cringe about the absurdity of the nerdity of literary scholars in general, dear God. But I mention it to get at the highly subjective and metaphorical concept of mood as it relates to story worlds. This is the what it is like to be there. Keeping things French for a minute, here's a paragraph from Albert Camus' The Stranger for Analysis. The sun was shining almost directly overhead onto the sand, and the glare on the water was unbearable. There was no one left on the beach. From inside the bungalows bordering the plateau and jutting out over the water, we could hear the rattling of plates and silverware. It was hard to breathe in the rocky heat rising from the ground. At first, Raymond and Masson discussed people and things I don't know about. I gathered they'd known each other for a long time and had even lived together at one point. We headed down to the sea and walked along the water's edge. Now and then a little wave would come up higher than the others and wet our canvas shoes. I wasn't thinking about anything because I was half asleep from the sun beating down on my bare head. What's this feel like? Well, it's hot for starters. In terms of the space in this passage, there are a few cues that allow the reader to map the space. Bungalows up on the plateau and a pathway leading down to the natural boundary of the sea. But just as prominent are cues to mood, the unbearable glare from the water, the rattling plates and silverware, the heat so oppressive that it's difficult to breathe, the waves lapping at their canvas shoes, and the sun beating down on the character narrator's head. The subjective feelings of what it is like comes from the character narrator's viewpoint. In philosophy and cognitive psychology, these subjective feelings are known as qualia, the ability to reliably cue the experience of qualia that stories evoke is one of the things that makes the empathic window of fiction unique in storytelling media. The simulation of a character's experience by the reader is an experience in itself. Unlike merely watching a character experience an environment on film, descriptions of a character's feelings in a specific environment, like the sound of plates and silverware clinking in the bungalows and the feel of the cool waves on your feet in the scorching heat, those give the reader a feel for the place, a mood. This passage by Camus makes me want to look for a shady tree to hide under, even reading it indoors in the dead of winter. Some things you might ask yourself in order to evoke a mood in your story world. Are there prominent smells, sounds? Is it light or dark, hot or cold, wet or dry, empty or crowded? Are there ways you could get your character to convey something tactile your reader can simulate? I've seen writers use this dirty little trick having the character do something like dig their toes into the carpet for no other reason than to evoke a tactile experience in their reader's mind, thereby heightening the experience of qualia. 
This can make the story world seem more real. Part of the art of drawing up a mood for your story world is selecting the right qualia cues. As both these passages demonstrate, mood, atmosphere, and the mapping of story world space don't happen independent of each other. There's not a lot of qualia in Groff's Paris passage, but the prominence of rain can certainly call up a feel of a damp, cool mood, just as the spatial cues and presence of waves and sun can help to create an atmosphere in Camus' portrayal of this seaside area in Algeria. Spatialization, atmosphere, and mood all work in concert with each other to create a broader experience of the whole story world. The combination of these spatial elements creates the story world, and the types of cues presented in the text produces an experience of differing immersiveness depending on which cues are given. I'm going to highlight three different modes of story world building and discuss their relative immersiveness. I'll start with the least immersive of the three modes, which I call abstract setting. Here, a writer either minimally cues or deliberately uses confounding spatial cues in order to inhibit spatial immersiveness in the story. There are a few ways a writer can accomplish this. One, offer no spatial cues, leaving it to the reader to interpret. Two, offer plentiful mood details while offering no spatial context in which to frame them. Three, offer such an excessive number of spatial details that it overwhelms the reader's capacity to contextualize them. Or four, offer contradictory cues that disnarrate the space and place elements of the story world. Here's an excerpt that does quite a few of these things. I am alone here now, under cover. Outside it is raining. Outside you walk through the rain with your head down, shielding your eyes with one hand, while you stare ahead nevertheless, a few yards ahead, at a few yards of wet asphalt. Outside it is cold. The wind blows between the bare black branches. The wind blows through the leaves, rocking the whole boughs, rocking, rocking them, their shadows swaying across the white rough cast walls. Outside the sun is shining, there is no tree, no bush to cast a shadow, and you walk under the sun shielding your eyes with one hand while you stare ahead only a few yards in front of you at a few yards of dusty asphalt where the wind makes patterns of parallel lines, forks, and spirals. This passage challenges the reader to construct a story world from a great many atmospheric details with very few cues that orient the reader in space. There's an outside and a here now under cover that create an implicit boundary between in and out, but there isn't enough to build much of a mapped space from these cues. There are also disnarrated mood details, rain and wet asphalt and black boughs casting shadows. And then the sun is shining and there are no trees to cast a shadow. There's also such an abundance of detail that it's difficult to process them all. In the end, what the reader gets is an abstract, impressionistic space without many cues to place, all atmosphere and mood. A passage like this can confound immersion, perhaps highlighting a character's sense of alienation or disorientation, or perhaps even simply compelling these emotions in the reader herself. The next story world building mode I call realist stage building. Stage building is the process of a narrator pausing the plot's progression to offer extended straight description of the spatial map and atmospheric details to bring a vivid story world space into focus. Like all narrative moves, this is a risk versus reward calculation. With stage building, the writer must calculate how long they can rely on the reader's interest in constructing a vivid story world space against the reader's desire for a suspenseful plot that moves the story along. Stage building is a mode that, if the reader is willing to go with it, can produce a vivid and detailed cognitive stage on which the story will then unfold. You only need to describe the main setting elements once, and if you don't lose the reader's interest in the process, very few spatial cues will need to be presented later for the reader to call up complete and realistic spatial imagery. This leaves a lot of room to highlight the events that unfold, and, in the end, the reader will leave the story world with a vivid sense of space and place. Some Victorian-era novelists would painstakingly stage-build their characters' homes, almost to the extent that they mimicked a modern-day real estate agent showing a property. Here's an example of a brief passage of stage-building from the early stages of Sandra Cisneros' novel, The House on Mango Street. But the house on Mango Street is not the way they told it at all. 
It's small and red with tight steps in front and windows so small you'd think they were holding their breath. Bricks are crumbling in places, and the front door is so swollen you have to push hard to get in. There is no front yard, only four little elms the city planted by the curb. Out back is a small garage for the car we don't own yet, and a small yard that looks smaller between the two buildings on either side. There are stairs in our house, but they're ordinary hallway stairs, and the house only has one washroom. Everybody has to share a bedroom. Mama and Papa, Carlos and Kiki, me and Nenny. This passage of stage building certainly doesn't rise to the level of patience testing with its readers. This paragraph, though, pauses to give spatial details that helps the reader build a mental map of the house with specific landmarks and atmospheric details. The benefit is that the house, an important enough feature in the novel to bear the title, is spatially solidified early in the story, allowing the characters to inhabit a well-drawn place as the story moves along. Stage building, if done well, can leave a reader with a vivid spatial memory, but it's a particularly risky move in short fiction, which requires a plot to be cued, constrained, and resolved in a short span. If the prose itself isn't exquisite, most readers are only so willing to tolerate a long stage building process. The third and most common mode of story world building I call realist piecemeal. In this mode, spatial cues appear only when they become relevant to the plot or to offer details that help the reader visualize the space where the current events are unfolding. The cues here, like with stage building, are selected to be useful in both mapping space and creating a sense of place. Landmarks that orient characters, pathways that help readers track movement, and useful cues to mood and atmosphere all pepper the text in between the plot elements. In the case of piecemeal story world building, though, the stage is constructed as the story moves along, leaving the reader with a vivid, complete sense of the story world place and space by the time the story is finished. This means that the text will become more spatially immersive as the story moves along, and will be at its most immersive at the climax of the story and its resolution. It's a great approach to building a story world in a short story, and just as useful in longer works like novellas and novels. Pick up most novels, and you should have no trouble picking out examples of piecemeal story world building. A few important closing thoughts on space and place are warranted. The first is that the setting of the story often interacts with the plot of the story in ways both subtle and critical. Sometimes the interaction will be an obvious plot constraint. For a good example of this, you might read Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Amontillado, where the character narrator, in a ploy for revenge, leads his rival down into the catacombs beneath his estate. The seclusion, the night are on the walls, and the darkness all offer the narrator's victim ample reason to turn back while the narrator attempts to prod him further into the darkness with evil intent. Here, the enclosed setting is a plot constraint. Another example that comes to mind is Lawrence Sargent Hall's The Ledge, where a fisherman and his son become stranded on an exposed rock while fishing at low tide. The rising tide and the freezing water become the actual danger that the party contends with. Other times the influence of setting on the story can be much subtler. In my examination of several stories where dilemma represented the primary plot element, I found that each of the plots I explored in depth were set in places that had clear boundaries to constrain the character's movement. The Frenchman's barn in Groff's Delicate Edible Birds is one example, while a fenced-in army base in a boarding school represented two other story world spaces that subtly constrained the character's emotional dilemmas by forcing the characters to share space with their rivals, while the dilemma simmers. Though it certainly isn't a requisite element for a dilemma narrative, an enclosed space helps to turn up the heat on characters and may subliminally cue the sense of psychological entrapment the characters feel by cueing the reader to execute their simulation from within that confined space. As I said, subtle. Similarly, with the character narrator, the mood of the character can also affect the portrayal of the story world element, as Janet Barraway notes. Imagine experiencing a thunderstorm when in the throes of a new love, the rain might seem to glitter, the lightning to sizzle, the thunder to rumble with anticipation. The downpour would be fresh and exhilarating nourishing the newly budding romance. 
Then imagine how the very same storm would feel in the midst of a lousy romantic breakup. The raindrops would be thick and cold, almost greasy. The lightning would slash at the clouds. The thunder would growl. Torrents of rain would beat the delicate tulips to the ground. The landscapes of story worlds can set the mood, and at other times the characters can impose their mood on the setting. No hard and fast rules here, just conventions to be bent and broken as needed. Finally, it's worth thinking about how we might construct the most immersive and least immersive story worlds we can imagine for reference. What would these two extremes look like? A supremely immersive spatial environment in a narrative would have balanced cues that complement the plot without overwhelming the reader in descriptive detail. Spatial elements would be clear and consistent, providing borders, pathways, and landmarks that allow the reader to place the characters accurately on the spatial map of the story world, likely through the use of proper names with many schematic associations. There would also be atmospheric details that help the reader to experience the space as a unique place with character, while mood details like qualia, sounds, smells, tastes, or feelings would help the reader to simulate a sense of what it would be like to be in that story world. All these descriptive details and spatial cues in the text find that Goldilocks zone where they aren't too frequent or sparse, calling up much of their persuasive force from associative memory of schematic details. By contrast, the least immersive space would lack much of what we outlined above, few borders, pathways, or landmarks with no proper place names, offering the reader little chance of properly orienting the characters on the map. Details would cue as little schematic memory as possible, giving the bare minimum in terms of spatial information. Given that readers will spatialize even in the absence of cues, conflicting or confounding or overwhelming numbers of cues will likely be more disorienting than a complete lack of spatial cues. In other words, end-stage Henry James type stuff. See The Jolly Corner for reference. So that's the story world, space and place. The question of how much or how little the story world should be highlighted in the story is, as always, up to the writer. It's also likely to vary from story to story. Some stories evoke a strong sense of place and prove extremely immersive. Some highlight events and unfold in generic places that de-emphasize the importance of character surroundings. With these tools in hand, reading, deconstructing, and emulating stories that treat space well is a good strategy for learning to build the story worlds you'd like your readers to experience. Within the space and place, and scattered about the characters in a story world, are objects, obviously. For a world to feel real and well-rounded, objects need to play a part in the story. Sometimes they may play a vital role, like the One Ring to rule Middle-earth, or they may be a decorative detail to lend a touch of authenticity to the story world. They can be specifically described objects or merely schematic elements. And just like in real life, there are so many objects, they can't all be notable or worth mentioning. So, what's worth mentioning? Certainly objects that have a direct interaction with the plot must be mentioned. In some cases, an object as the pursuit of a goal may be the main plot element of a story. An excellent example is Sherman Alexie's short story, What You Pawn I Will Redeem, where the protagonist, Jackson Jackson, is a homeless Native American who comes across his grandmother's long-missing powwow regalia in a pawn shop in Seattle. When Jackson convinces the shop owner that the regalia rightly belongs to him, he agrees to hold the item for 24 hours instead of selling it. The rest of the story documents Jackson's quest to raise the money he needs to recover an object that's precious to him. In this case, the object is a critical part of the story. Can't leave that out. Here's how Jackson narrates it. That's my grandmother's powwow regalia in your window, I said. Somebody stole it from her 50 years ago, and my family has been searching for it ever since. The pawnbroker looked at me like I was a liar. I understood. Pawn shops are filled with liars. I'm not lying, I said. 
Ask my friends here. They'll tell you. He's the most honest Indian I know, Rose of Sharon said. All right, honest Indian, the pawnbroker said. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Can you prove it's your grandmother's regalia? Because they don't want to be perfect, because only God is perfect, Indian people sew flaws into their powwow regalia. My family always sewed one yellow bead somewhere on our regalia, but we always hid it so that you had to search really hard to find it. If it really is my grandmother's, I said, there will be one yellow bead hidden somewhere on it. All right, then, the pawnbroker said. Let's take a look. He pulled the regalia out of the window, laid it down on the glass counter, and we searched for that yellow bead and found it hidden beneath the armpit. There it is, the pawnbroker said. He didn't sound surprised. You were right. This is your grandmother's regalia. Between this scene and a previous reference to Jackson's grandmother dancing in it, the regalia offers the reader the opportunity to schematically build this important object, using their impression of what it might look like. Plus, there's that one hidden yellow bead, which is a clever way of adding uniqueness and authenticity to an object that is now not only personal to Jackson, but also to the reader's image of that object as well. Jackson's quest to possess this object consumes the remainder of the narrative. Even if the reader may struggle to connect Jackson's actions to his main goal, they might not always seem to directly overlap and may very well contradict, but the clock is always ticking down to the end of the day and the question of whether Jackson can recover what is rightfully his. Of course, an object doesn't necessarily need to be the point of a story to impact the plot. Objects, as Jackson's grandmother's regalia shows, can be imbued with meaning, sentimental, symbolic, or otherwise. One of my favorite examples of an object that takes on meaning to the plot comes from Philip Roth's short story, Defender of the Faith. In it, the protagonist, Sergeant Marx, gets into a running conflict with a manipulative private under his command. This private, Grossbart, has steadily manipulated Marx into allowing him to break the rules on account of their shared Jewish heritage, despite the fact Marx doesn't like Grossbart very much. Marx gets pushed into giving Grossbart and his friends a weekend pass to leave the base against army regulations, and in return he asks Grossbart to bring him a piece of gefilte fish from the Seder dinner Grossbart tells Marx his aunt is hosting. This is what happens when Grossbart returns. I notice for the first time a little paper bag in his hand. Grossbart, I smiled. My gift? Oh yes, Sergeant. Here, from all of us. He handed me the bag. It's egg roll. Egg roll? I accepted the bag and felt a damp grease spot on the bottom. I opened it, sure that Grossbart was joking. We thought you'd probably like it. You know, Chinese egg roll. We thought you'd probably have a taste for... Your aunt served egg roll? She wasn't home. Grossbart, she invited you. You told me she invited you and your friends. I know, he said. I just reread the letter. Next week. I got out of bed and walked to the window. Grossbart, I said. But I was not calling to him. Grossbart, get out. Get out and stay the hell away from me, because if I see you, I'll make your life miserable. You understand that? Yes. I let him free, and when he walked from the room, I wanted to spit on the floor where he had stood. I couldn't stop the fury. It engulfed me, owned me, till it seemed I could only rid myself of it with tears or an act of violence. I snatched from the bed the bag Grossbart had given me, and, with all my strength, threw it out the window. And the next morning, as the men policed the area around the barracks, I heard a great cry go up from one of the trainees who had been anticipating only his morning handful of cigarette butts and candy wrappers. Egg roll, he shouted. Holy Christ! Chinese goddamn egg roll! Though it may be apocryphal, Freud is often credited with stating something along the lines of, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. But just as often in psychoanalysis as in story analysis, objects have multiple meanings. And this egg roll is not just an egg roll. It becomes the symbol of Grossbart's casual relationship with the truth and his disregard for others. He cons Marx into giving him special treatment, and he offers a token of appreciation that instead comes to symbolize his deceit. That this object comes in a greasy paper bag is doubly poetic. The egg roll is physical proof that Grossbart doesn't respect Marx enough to be honest with him, and thus it gets chucked out the window to serious, though comic, effect. Even further, some objects, by virtue of their function, become symbolic in deeper ways. 
In Karen Russell's short story, St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves, shoes take on a symbolic role of enculturation. Claudette, the character narrator, emphasizes this point by mentioning shoes, hers and others, as the girls' enculturation at the school progresses. I remember how disorienting it was to look down and see two square-toed shoes instead of my own four feet. Keep your mouth shut, I repeated during our walking drills, staring straight ahead. Keep your shoes on your feet. Mouth shut. Shoes on feet. Don't chew on your new penny loafers. The narrator's emphasis on the importance of shoes in this early passage makes the ensuing reference to her older sister's shoes take on more symbolic meaning. Jeanette spiffed her penny loafers until her very shoes seemed to gloat. Linguists have since traced the colloquial origins of goody two-shoes back to our facilities. The need to wear shoes contrasts with the character's earlier wild state, which progresses from wolf-like to bipedalism to proper posture, and even to an emphasis on correctly performing dance moves toward the end of their stay at this strange little academy. The shoes possess deeper meaning, symbolizing the way culture constrains both behavior and feet. Mouth shut, bro. Shoes on feet. Don't eat your penny loafers. And sometimes a shoe is just a shoe. There are times when an object in the story world impacts neither the plot nor any other deeper meaning for that matter. Sometimes an object is simply mentioned to cue the reader to form an image of an object in its environment. The placement of seemingly irrelevant objects offers readers a detail that lends a touch of authenticity to the story world. Narrative theorists call an object of this type a reality effect. I go into the kitchen and find our mother washing fruit. She asks what's going on. I tell her nothing is. Nothing at all. She sighs over an apple's imperfection. The curtains sport blue teapots. Our mother works the apple with a scrub brush. She believes they come coated with poison. The narrator in this scene spends far more time mentioning the apple, but that object is part of what's going on in the story. The narrator here is a child, and he's lying about something, and his mother, preoccupied by the fruit, is going to allow him to get away with it. This interaction is symbolic of the nature of their relationship. Symbolic of nothing, though, are the curtains with blue teapots. They don't tell the reader anything about the family except that they have curtains with blue teapots on them. Perhaps that may say something superficial about the family, but it's definitely a stretch to infer any deeper meaning here. This is a reality effect, an object placed by the narrator to lend a sense of authenticity to the scene. It is verisimilitude in object form. It's just there to give the reader a sense that this is a real kitchen, complete with curtains that have blue teapots on them. Very domesticated. The right strategically placed reality effect can help to make a story world seem immersive and true to the reader. The discussion of objects and their relative symbolic value is more appropriate to the discussion of subtext than story world. We'll get to this shortly. Here, I'll say a quick final word about how objects are described. Because as we can see from the examples mentioned above, descriptions can be as vague and entirely schematic as the blue teapots on the curtains, or intricately detailed as in this description of the roof of a dreamy little rural cabin in Melville's The Piazza. On one slope, the roof was deeply weather-stained, and nigh the turfy eaves trough, all velvet napped, no doubt the snail monks founded mossy priories there. The other slope was newly shingled. Something as simple as a roof can be used by the narrator to call up specific imagery in the reader's mind, through both concrete and abstract details. Objects that are important to the plot or symbolic are always going to warrant a mention of their presence, but objects that aren't plot-related can aid the reader in building a vivid story world when they're the right objects described in the right way. Though it may not be wise to overwhelm your reader by mentioning every little knick-knack in your character's bedroom, a dancing hula girl on her dashboard or a cactus on his coffee table might help bring their world to life. Put an object or two in your story world and see if it doesn't spruce things up a bit.
We've talked a lot about the importance of images to the reader's cognitive simulation of a story. In the opening lesson to this story world section, I mentioned that a good way to think of a story is as a series of viewpoint-centered images arranged in a particular temporal sequence. From this series of images, a larger sense of a complete story world takes hold in the reader's mind, but some images matter more than others. Some images stick. This fact may also harken back to our discussion of the importance of memory and its relationship to images and stories. You can't completely remember a story the way you experienced it as you read it. There's far too much information. It's one of the main reasons we write stories down. But even reading the same story again and again will produce a slightly different experience each time. The memory of the experience of reading a story will inevitably become blurrier and blurrier as time passes. And I've found that even with really great stories, what I'm left with at the end are a few vivid images that call the story to mind once the reading experience has ended. These are the types of images I'm talking about here, the images that last in the reader's mind, lingering in the memory, carrying baggage to be reopened at a later time. I like to think of these types of images as a sort of freeze frame in the cognitive simulation that burns itself into the reader's memory. How do great writers accomplish the presentation of a vivid, lasting image? i found no scholarship on this phenomenon, which isn't to say that it's not out there, but I haven't been made aware of it. Nor have I read much about this from writers by way of practical advice, except the usual observation that great writers do this. Or, sometimes writers or scholars may ponder the aspects of a striking image in isolation. Unfortunately, i found the discussion so far on this topic isn't particularly satisfying in terms of creating a lesson plan for students to learn this skill. Thus, I've developed this lesson as a starting point I hope will be helpful as both a tool for students and a jumping-off point for narrative theorists. I'd like to start this discussion with a tip of the cap to the fiction writer's closest cousins in the verbal arts, the poets. Poetry, especially modern poetry, is extremely image-centric. In fact, if I were to draw a few distinctions between the two art forms, the major quality that distinguishes a poem would be the absence of suspense generated in a grammatical plot, followed by the importance of the line and meter. The greatest commonality, though, would be the importance of images, and poets are great at generating a striking image in an extremely economical way, so there's quite a lot to learn about generating images from poets. I'm going to present a couple poems as points of analysis to see what we can learn from a poet's approach to imagery. We'll draw a few conclusions from these poems, as well as a couple from fictional stories to generate some guidelines to help fiction writers craft lasting images. So here goes. The following poem by William Stafford is titled At the Bomb Testing Site. At noon in the desert, a panting lizard waited for history, its elbows tense, watching the curve of a particular road as if something might happen. It was looking at something farther off than people could see, an important scene, acted in stone, for little selves at the flute end of consequences. There was just a continent without much on it, under a sky that never cared less, ready for a change. The elbows waited. The hands gripped hard on the desert. We can look at several points in the text of the poem to get a sense of how Stafford is crafting an image. First, you might notice in the opening line that he follows the familiar ground figure order, offering, in the desert, a panting lizard. So the reader has a place to put that lizard in their mind's eye, a solid move. That the lizard is panting also sets the scene in motion, albeit slightly. He mentions tense elbows to go with the panting and finishes the stanza with a further tension-building phrase, as if something might happen. This image of a lizard staring into the distance of a lonely desert road, unaware of the looming explosion, presents a heavily loaded image that contrasts the potential destructiveness and self-importance of the human world with the ignorant and indifferent natural world going on about its business under a sky that never cared less. The poem returns the focus to the familiar elbows of the lizard and offers a tactile image, the hands gripping the desert, to leave the listener or reader with the same strong visual image of the lone lizard in the open desert, clutching the earth. There's a lot to like about how Stafford crafted such a vivid image. Okay, let's try one more. Here's an excerpt from Mary Oliver's poem, The Black Snake. When the black snake flashed onto the morning road, 
and the truck could not swerve. Death. That is how it happens. Now he lies looped and useless as an old bicycle tire. I stop the car and carry him into the bushes. He is as cool and gleaming as a braided whip. He is as beautiful and quiet as a dead brother. I leave him under the leaves. I have a bit of a reptile theme going, and sure enough, they're on similar ground, a road. This time, instead of getting bombed, the snake gets run over. I love the comparison of the dead snake to an old bicycle tire and later a braided whip. This helps to solidify the image of the snake in my mind. Again, the presence of a well-defined ground, the road, helps me to visualize the dead snake on the road. And movement along a pathway from the road to the leaves only aids in my effort to generate an image of this dead snake along this roadway. Each of these poems only offers the reader 60 or 70 words with which to form an image, yet they're both quite evocative. How does the poet do this? First, I've noted the importance of an explicitly defined ground, a desert near a road in the first poem, and a road near the bushes in the second poem. That helps facilitate a scene in the reader's mind. This is important. For an image to last in the reader's mind, it must be vivid to begin with, and it's hard to be vivid without a clear setting to visualize. Second, note the amount of schematic material the writers are calling up. In the first poem, the desert, the road, the rocks, the lizard, etc., while the second poem evokes a snake, a road, a truck, bushes, and all these items are schematic, unspecified. Yet both poets highlight details they draw the reader's focus to specifically. In the first poem, Stafford cues the reader to focus on the lizard's elbows and its hands gripping the floor of the desert. In the second poem, it's a pair of visual metaphors, the bicycle tire and the braided whip. These precise cues call the reader to alter their schematic renderings in a very specific way. It isn't that the language in these poems is ornate or elaborate. In fact, you might call the language plain, but the way in which both poets alter the schematic imagery is what gives these scenes their unique image-defining force. Long story short, if you have a reptile on a road, you've got yourself a winning poem. But seriously, there are a couple of generalizations we can draw from these and other poems that will be useful in forming a set of guidelines that can help fiction writers to poach these effective image-creating moves of our poet cousins. These poets make use of a ground so that the image has a place to live. They also offer an important focus, something of consequence to live on that ground. And they alter schematic material with a few unique details that cue a specific rendering of the image. And because they're poets, they do it in a short word count, in stanzas, and with a cadence and rhythm appropriate to poetry. Additionally, both poems have narrative elements to them especially the second, where actions unfold in a specific temporal progression. We can add to these ideas a couple of important elements from fictional narratives, a pause in the narration, as well as the image's place in the story, to complete a set of five characteristics common to lasting images from fictional stories. I offer these commonalities not as requirements for a lasting image, but they do appear frequently. You might not need to check every box to create a lasting image, but an image that possesses four of these five qualities stands a better chance of building a lasting image in the reader's mind than an image formed only with one. Here they are in full. 1. The image has a frame for it to live in. That is, there's a clear ground, perhaps even with borders, that presents a platform for the image to stand upon. 2. The image is an important element to the story that calls readers to focus on and remember it. It's critical to the story. 3. The text calls attention to specific details using descriptive language in that moment, both calling on schematic material and deviating from those schematic cues in exacting ways. 4. The narrative seems to pause, and often does so in the narrative sense, presenting the image through a pause in duration, more linking than action verbs. Time stops. The lasting image appears concurrent with the most important moment or moments in the plot of the story, a major fork in the road, the climax, or the end. With those five points in hand, we'll examine a couple lasting images from short stories that make use of many of these points to create staying power. The following is an excerpt from Nathan Englander's story, How We Avenge the Blooms. 
This story is about a group of Jewish boys who are being terrorized by a bully they call the Anti-Semite. In an effort to get back at the Anti-Semite for the way they've been mistreated, the boys seek out the help of the toughest Jew they know, Ace Cohen, and they convince a reluctant Ace to fight the Anti-Semite for them. For the record, I highly recommend reading the story in its entirety before spoiling it with this passage. Go do that now. Spoilers begin. The climactic fight ends with one mighty punch from Ace Cohen. He, the anti-Semite, caught it right on the chin. He took it without rocking back, an exceptional feat, even before we knew that his jaw was broken. He remained stock still for a second or two. Not a bit of him moved except for that bottom jaw which had unhinged like a snake's and made a solid quarter turn to the side. Then he dropped. Ace pushed his way through the circle we'd formed. It closed right back up around the anti-Semite, bloodied and now writhing before us. As I watched him, I knew I'd always feel that to be broken was better than to break. My failing. I also knew that the deep rumble rolling through us was only nerves, a sensitivity to imagined repercussion, as if a sound were built into revenge. What we really shared in that instance was simple. Anyone who stood with us that day will tell you the same. With the anti-Semite at our feet, confusion came over us all. We stood there, looking at that crushed boy, and none of us knew when to run. The first of the five points we highlighted is present here, the frame. In this case, the boys themselves create the frame inside the larger ground of the park where this fight unfolds. But Englander's narrator cleverly calls attention to this frame in a way that seems organic to the story. Ace pushed his way through the circle we'd formed. It closed right back up around the anti-Semite, bloodied and now writhing before us. So the reader is cued to visualize this circle of boys surrounding the anti-Semite as he lay on the ground within the circle they'd made around him. This image is key to the plot of the story. It's the very embodiment of the revenge the boys spend the entire story seeking. And Englander does call up both schematic material to visualize, a punch bully, but he also alters it in a specific and unique way. That bottom jaw, which had unhinged like a snake's and made a solid quarter turn to the side. It's not a particularly poetic image, but it is unique and immediately evocative of the anti-Semite's specific injury when placed on a human avatar. And in that moment, the narration pauses. The final two paragraphs of the story are almost completely atemporal. It's as though the narrator hits the pause button to leave the moment on a freeze frame, while he and the readers contemplate the potential meaning of this almost uncanny moment, where the revenge they sought is fulfilled before them and is simultaneously more grotesque than they ever could have known. Finally, it is the ultimate moment in the story. It's placed right at the most significant event, so that the reader is left with this image as they ponder the story upon its completion. It's a mesmerizing moment in this story, and when I think of stories that leave me with a lasting image, this is one of the stories that immediately comes to mind. It's vivid and has burned itself into my memory, largely, I suspect, because the narrator hits all five points we mentioned with the type of fierce efficiency that Englander's work is so replete with. Here's a look at a different type of vivid image from another great short story writer, Rick Bass. And again, I implore you to read the story before I spoil it here. The story, Fires, involves a male narrator named Joe who lives deep in rural Montana and has spent the summer accompanying a beautiful long-distance runner named Glenda, whom he cycles behind with a gun to protect her from the grizzly bears that often appear on the isolated roads she trains on. They've fallen in love but have resisted the urge to get together because neither of them wants to face the end of the summer when Glenda leaves Montana to compete in races all over the world. On her final day in Montana, she inexplicably sets a fire in Joe's field that quickly burns out of control. They run for safety into the small pond in Joe's backyard. It was just a grass fire, but the heat was intense as it rushed toward us, blasting our faces with the hot winds. It was terrifying. We ducked our heads under the water to cool our drying faces and splashed water on each other's shoulders. Birds were flying past us, and grasshoppers and small mice were diving into the pond with us where hungry trout were rising and snapping at them, swallowing them like corn. It was growing dark and there were flames all around us. 
We could only wait and see if the grass was going to burn itself up as it swept past. Please, love, Glenda was saying, and I did not understand at first that she was speaking to me. Please. We had moved out into the deepest part of the pond, chest deep and having to duck beneath the surface because of the heat. Our lips and faces were blistering. Pieces of ash were floating down on the water like snow. It was not until nightfall that the flames died down, just a few orange ones flickering here and there. But all the rest of the small field was black and smoldering and still too hot to walk across barefooted. The frame in this scene isn't quite as explicit as Englander's, but it's not entirely absent either. The small pond itself has a border, and even if the shore isn't a clear enough boundary, the presence of the smoke certainly hems the two characters into a specific place in the story world. Joe and Glenda together in the water are the most important elements in the story. Their kindling relationship is the focus of the entire plot, and their confinement in such close proximity forces them together and forces the reader to picture them there with a literal hot fire and cool water enfolding them in a battle for survival, all while their figurative romance is enduring the same struggle between hot and cold. Schematic material here are the characters, the small pond, the water, and the animals. But Bass's narrator points to several specific pointed details to create a unique image. The fish swallowing up the grasshoppers and small mice, like corn, and the ash floating down onto the water like snow. The scene doesn't exactly pause because it spans an unspecified but not insignificant time. Yet within that time, it does seem to pause for them. They're stuck as the birds rush past and the ash flutters to the surface of the pond. They're left there clutching each other as they hope for the fire to pass them by unharmed. It's placed at the climax of the story. This is the resolution to the summer-long love affair that was always waiting to be kindled. The story doesn't end here exactly, but the main plot is resolved, and all that remains is the narrator's attempt to come to terms with Glenda's departure the following day. It's such a simple, elegant story from an equally elegant writer. And what a resounding image it presents the reader to carry with them. Those are merely two. I suggest you seek out some of the images from stories that have burned themselves into your memory. Look for the five points I highlighted above. Not all the lasting images I've examined explicitly fulfill all five of these points, but most hit four solidly, and many do hit five. An important point I learned in developing this lesson is that great writers rarely overcook things to generate a lasting scene, because you don't have to. The combination of schematic material plus a few unique details is usually more than enough to call a startlingly vivid image to the reader's mind's eye with surprising efficiency. And we might as well make that a closing point on space and place in the story world. We've covered all the different ways your reader will process spatializing cues including ways to generate the most and least immersive environments. Your reader's imagination is your best friend, as it doesn't take much to evoke a vivid story world for them to experience in rich detail, most of which they'll provide on their own. Space is all too often the forgotten element of written fiction, but with the tools we've explored in this section in hand, you now have the knowledge to ensure your story world space is as rich or as sparse as you care to make it. So give your readers an experience they'll never forget by taking them places they can only go in a book. Oh,